Hi, Dr. Vidali here. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to look at a robotic surgery uh, performed by me. I have permission from the patient to uh, publish this video. The video is edited, but at a normal speed. So essentially what uh, we have done with the editing, we have removed areas where uh, things are just not moving along hesitation, things like that. So the video in itself, although it is 20 minutes, is reflective of a surgery that lasted about an hour, which is still a pretty short time if you think about the extensiveness of the surgery. But let's get on with the operation. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't give you like a, a full view of uh, uh, what the panoramic view, but we started recording it just a little, a tad bit late. So starting on the right side, first thing I like to mention about my technique is that um, I uh, use um, a technique uh, which I call a technique that does not involve laterality. Uh, uh, so you never really have a right-handed or a left-handed. The instruments that I choose robotically are placed taking advantage that every surgeon um, with a robot can be an ambidextrous surgeon. What this allows us to do is to actually um, take advantage of the ability of using traction medially. Just remember that the disease in endometriosis um, uh, is always in the center of the pelvis and therefore allowing us to uh, do a dissection by doing medial retraction with the grasper and a lateral retract and uh, so medial uh, lateral to medial retraction and uh, keeping the scissors laterally and you will see that pr throughout the operation I will keep on shifting my instruments left to right like for instance here you can see that I actually the scissor that was initially in my left hand now is in uh, my uh, right hand sorry, vice versa. Uh, so uh, every endometriotic procedure uh, starts with the um, ident it's identification of the ureter on each side and dissection of the ureter. This helps uh, speed up the operation uh, because um, once your ureters are, ureters are lateralized, you don't have to worry too much about hitting them when you're working more centrally. Um, this is, of course, going to be a nerve sparing surgery as, as you can see, as I am dissecting the peritoneum and I'm entering um, the retroperitoneal space, you could see that um, already can identify uh, some retroperitoneal structures. One thing that I'd like you to notice is that I rely heavily on uh, my assistant, the assist, both with suction and with traction on the bowel. Um, I think that is important to remember that although one is very independent robotically, the assistant can really facilitate your operation greatly. Uh, one of the things you notice in this operation, I'm only using two instruments, which is um, somewhat common for me. Sometimes I like to use two, sometimes I like to use three, um, obviously, in terms of expense, there isn't like a huge difference, but this person, this patient was a very small patient. So um, they had a very, very small uh, pelvis and therefore uh, there was very limited space in their abdominal wall to put three instruments. And the surgery is moving along pretty well, as you can see. Um, this patient is uh, in her late 20s and has had about 10 years uh, history of disease and of certain pelvic pain, but she was only recently diagnosed with the disease. And um, prior to the surgery, they had their um, egg frozen uh, in order to uh, perform some fertility preservation. Uh, note that there were two endometriomas, one on the left, one on the right ovary, and they were both kissing ovaries. Okay, so we've done a peritonectomy on the left pelvic sidewall, and now we're gonna proceed with dissection. Um, one thing you're gonna notice is the key to nerve preservation. The first key is that you have to be able to see the, the nerves. And uh, uh, you're gonna see me open um, 
uh, first the rectovaginal space and, uh, and then uh, progressively dissect out um, and identify, delineate the nerves so that um, as the dissection proceeds, the nerves are preserved. So the first, the first element of nerve preserving operation, which is the gold standard uh, at this point of, of um, endometriosis surgery. And this was a standard that was uh, developed by the group of Dr. Cecharoni um, in Verona. And uh, at least that's a group that's published the most and the earliest on nerve preserving, first nerve identification and then nerve preserving surgery. And um, this standard requires identification of the nerves and also um, as well as preservation, obviously. Uh, you could see that in this case, uh, endometriosis is removed along with um, some uh, perirectal fat that is clearly uh, abnormal um, uh, and uh, uh, clearly with desmoplastic changes. Now, as one thing that you notice that uh, you could see that my assistant alternates the use of the sucker, of the suction, with uh, traction on the bowel. I'm also using a Valchev uterine manipulator in the uterus, which really is very helpful in delineating uh, the uh, posterior aspect of the vagina and the cervix. Um, what you see there, um, this is the actual the rectovaginal fascia, but what you see there is uh, the tip of the valchev that elevates the, that, that pushes against the vagina. The, the cervix is going to be a little bit higher. So as we dissect out progressively the um, uh, uh, the left uh, pararectal fossa, you could see that a lot of that uh, perirectal fat is actually desmoplastic and therefore abnormal. These changes are due to inflammation uh, and, uh, and are very, very clear. Um, the fat doesn't have the same color and certainly doesn't have the more the same consistency. It becomes hardened. Now, as one of the things that you may notice is that there's different uh, fascial layers uh, in the pelvis. And uh, you, you're, many of the organs in the pelvis, many of the nerves of the vessels are contained within their own fascial layers. And uh, along with that, uh, along with that, those fascial layer, you also have the actual pelvic fascia, which is also thicker. But one of the things that you notice um, here as I dissect the nerves in the uh, in the hypogastric plexus on the right side, on the left side, you can see that these nerves, uh, this this bundle of nerves, which contains both um, sympathetic and and parasympathetic fibers as well as some somatic fibers, is contained in its own fascial layer. Can you see that? You can see that these nerves are contained in their own fascial layer, and uh, and. Uh, it's important to notice and preserve that uh, to a maximum degree. You can see as I, I uh, dissected all the disease out, I, I strive to maintain the integrity of the fascial layer. Now moving off to the right side, uh, there is significant disease and uh, tissue uh, alteration, inflammation with dysmoplastic changes of the fat um, in the, along the right uterosacral ligament. Um, in this case, the disease was deep, but uh, not very deep that required dissection or, or in going completely in the posterior rectal space. So we could just stay anteriorly and just work our way in the mesorectal area. Um, again, great attention to preserve the nerves. Uh, a lot of nerve, a lot of nerve are can be invaded. Many nerves can be invaded, but we do know that in terms of symptoms any endometriotic lesion that is within three centimeters from the um, from a nerve can affect the nerve behavior. And because of, of this, a patient can exhibit symptoms 
um, nerve symptoms, even if there isn't any direct invasion. But here, clearly, you could see that some of the nerve fibers were clearly distorted and pulled immediately. Um, here we are both excising disease and restoring normal anatomy. Um, before starting the operation, I always perform a cystoscopy and inject ICG green um, in the ureters, which helps uh, facilitate the visualization of the ureters. Um, you could see a little bit of additional spill and that's due to the hysteroscopy they also performed. Um, I, um, I call this part of the procedure rectal degloving uh, because we're sort of removing some of the serosal cover of the rectum without entering the rectum itself. Again, developing the right pararectal space um, excising disease from the mesorectum. And uh, you could see that although this robot doesn't have haptic features, uh, visually and also with the help of the assistant, we can definitely identify presence or absence of disease. Again, identifying the fascial layer that contains the nerve is very essential. And uh, again, here proceeding with a dissection in the uh, right pararectal space. You can see again that that fat certainly does not look normal. Uh, again, the assistant is helping both with uh, suction irrigation. Very little irrigation really, because I really don't like to use large amounts of irrigation and, uh, and uh, dissection uh, of, um, again, a large, Perirectal, pararect, right pararectal nodule um, at the corner with the uterosacral ligament. Um, notice that I mostly use the scissor, the monopolar scissor, as a as um, closed, um, almost as if I was using uh, a hook, but with the benefit of better mobility in the hook itself. Um, Now uh, the action moves on to dissection and excision of disease on the right uh, peritoneal sidewall. Um, this patient had, like I just said earlier, bilateral endometriomas, and uh, these were pretty aggressive endometriomas. We call these type two endometriomas as opposed to type one. Type two endometriomas derive from the invagination of the of the of the ovarian tissue and. Uh, sometimes, uh, and they develop from a coalescence of multiloculated uh, lesions on the surface of the ovary. And they're more aggressive, uh, more difficult to dissect out, and uh, in my opinion, more damaging to the ovary as well. Um, type 1 endometriomas come more from endometriotic invasion of the um, of a pre-existent follicle and therefore are easier to dissect. In this patient's situation, uh, they had a significant inflammation of the tissue uh, that really compressed because of the, the, the presence of the uh, ovary, the, uh, the uh, retroperineal space. And you can see that here I'm entering the retroperitoneal area and you're gonna see in this case that there's gonna be as well pretty significant invasion of the um, uh, of, of the right parametrium. Again, uh, the key to the dissection here is number one, keep your scissors lateral to the disease and uh, therefore lateral to the pelvis that is. Therefore you could use your your grasper for traction and counter traction. In this case, what you see here is a folding of the peri of the of the parietal peritoneum, and um, that uh, involved uh, with the, with the subsequent fibrosis and inflammation involved uh, the, uh, the the vascular component, um, including uh, the uterine vessel. Uh, and the uh, both artery and vein. Um, 
I performed a full dissection here and you could see obviously on the right side your iliac uh, vein. Uh, you could see your obliterated umbilical um, and as well as your uterine artery. Again here, uh, safely dissecting the ureter and completely dissecting all the disease from the uh, right parametrium um, with a uh, sort of modified radical um, approach. Um, if necessary, ligation of one or even two uterine artery can be performed even in patients who are desiring future fertility. In this patient's case, it was not necessary, but you could see how, um, in this case, they definitely had very significant uh, disease that had to be completely eradicated from uh, the right parametrial area. And not eradicating this disease would un unquestionably resolve in uh, potential ureteral, um, potential ureteral um, blockage and uh, significant um, and significant damage and potential a potential need for a, a ureter reimplantation at a later time. Um, as we proceed with the dissection, now that the right pelvic sidewall is completely clean of disease and you can pretty much see the whole anatomy at this point. Uh, we dissect further the ureter a little bit more um, cow, in a cow dead fashion, and, uh, but still preserving that fascia layer that contains uh, the um, hypogastric plexus. Um, at this point, attention is on the opposite side and the posterior aspect of the uterus. Um, again, here you could see preservation of the nerve bundles on both sides of the rectum. Uh, please notice the role of the assistant that's pulling on the rectum and the rectal traction is extremely important. Um, here you could see that I am dissecting off uh, the right fallopian tube. The right fallopian tube is a little bit uh, distended, a little bit enlarged, but um, following the patient's uh, wishes, we um, preserved um, the right tube, although it was a little bit dilated, but because the uh, fimbria were open, I felt uh, comfortable given their young age to uh, preserve um, preserve the um, fallopian tube. Um, the left ovary contained a small endometrioma, type two endometrioma. And also again here on the right side, you can see another type two endometrioma. How do we understand that it's a type two? Well, ultrasonographically you see the sign, but some of the classic signs are the multiloculation, the fact that it's a lot more tenacious uh, to the ovary and that it involves a lot more um, cortical tissue of the ovary. All these parts, components together are part of the um, characteristics of a type um, two endometrioma. Um, Let me correct myself, type one endometrioma. Sorry about that. It's a type one endometrioma. Type two is um, the easier one to actually remove. Um, so now moving along with uh, the surgery, um, we could see that um, there was a lesion anteriorly on the bladder serosa uh, that dug a little bit deeper and we proceeded, we proceeded to removing that uh, lesion as well. Um, this doesn't dig all the way down to uh, the bladder, but some of these superficial lesions can cause some degree of bladder irritation uh, without any doubt. And um, 
That staple that you see there is from a prior uh, appendectomy that the patient had, um, which actually was uh, responsible for identifying the patient's endometriosis. Most likely, that was the reason why she went, the endometriosis was the reason why she went to the hospital to begin with, and then she ended up with the, um, with the appendectomy. At this point, um, I normally use uh, surgi uh, surgical glue to close the ovary, but this ovary was very splayed open, so I opted for a uh, suture closure of the ovary. Um, like I said, the advantages of the robot, in my opinion, are very clear. Uh, this technique, uh, the ambidextrous technique, uh, Switching hands left and right, I think, are extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, something that you should definitely consider if you're doing endometriosis surgery and using the robot. Uh, please don't forget to follow and subscribe to my channel. And thank you for following.